So uh, oh, how about in the Old Testament? Can you show us a few places where we see that maybe Jesus wasn't the name Jesus, but he was... Yeah, he was there. The angel of the Lord. Oh, yes. So that people, people will know that he wasn't just here in believe. the flesh, but, but prior to. You got it. He's all over the, the Old Testament. Now, let me show you why you're supposed to find Jesus in the Old Testament. Let me show you why. Then I'm going to show you where to find him. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 4. Trinitarians, listen. Because the Bible is a Trinitarian book. It's not a Muslim book. It's not a Unitarian book. It's not a Jehovah's Witness book. But she's asking me, can I show Jesus in the Old Testament who was active? Yes, because the New Testament tells you Jesus is in the Old Testament actively saving and judging. And I'm going to show it to you. But first, let me show you from the New Testament. You should find Jesus in the Old Testament appearing. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized <coughs> into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So if you guys were listening... Paul says when Moses led Israel with the leadership of the pillar of the cloud, the pillar of cloud and Moses guided Israel. The one in the cloud feeding them supernaturally was the spiritual rock, Christ. He just said that spiritual rock that was leading Moses and Israel who appeared in the pillar cloud, that was Jesus Christ our Lord. So he just told you Christ was there actively involved. Not only does Paul say it in 1 Corinthians, but in Hebrews 11, and if you can bring up the NIV, the new Indian version, Hebrews 11, read for us 24 to 27, sir. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Wait, you mean because Moses gave up his status and position and allowed himself to be insulted for whose sake? For the sake of Christ. You mean he gave up everything for Christ? Yes. That's what 26 says, Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26? Exactly. But now watch what it says about Christ in verse 27. Keep reading. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. <clears throat> he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Okay, guys, 26, 27, Hebrews 11 says, Moses gave up everything for the sake of Christ because he saw him who is invisible appear to him visibly. Here we're told Jesus, who is invisible by nature, appeared visibly to Moses, and Moses gave up everything for Jesus who appeared to him. Wow. Are you kidding me? So where do we find Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, let me give you one more example. John 8, 56 to 59. Here, this ties in with the I am statements, how to use it correctly. John 8, 56 to 59. And I'm going to show you where Jesus appears as the angel of Yahweh, not a creature, the father's messenger who is God. Watch here. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old, and, you, and have you seen Abraham? Now let's explain what they're saying. Jesus appeared as a man, a flesh and blood Jew, and he wasn't even 50 years old. And they're saying, wait, how do you know how Abraham reacted? You're saying Abraham wanted to see your day. He saw it and was glad. You're not even 50 years old. Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years. And then Jesus corrects them. Even though physically as a man I may not be 50, I'm much older than 50. Let me tell you how old I am. Now, he's, here's the answer. Read. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham became, I am. Did you catch it? No, I'm much older than 50. And yes, I did see Abraham. Because of a truth I tell you, even before Abraham came into being, I have been, I already was, and remain. So Jesus is claiming to have been there before Abraham, seen Abraham, Abraham saw him, just like Paul said, 
Christ was that spiritual rock that guided Moses and Israel in the pillar cloud. And contrary to this moron in the comment section, Hebrews eleven twenty seven is about Christ. He is the invisible appeared invisibly because if you read 26, you deceiver. It says Moses gave all everything up for Christ. Now let me show you where Jesus appears. We ready? Exodus 23, 20 to 23. Behold, I send an angel before you. Now guys, pay attention. God is speaking. I send an angel, a messenger before you. you Behold, know? I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Obey who? Obey the angel's voice. Why? Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now pay attention, guys. The angel has the power to forgive sins, and God is warning Israel. You better obey him. Do not anger him. Because if you anger him, he won't forgive your sins, because my name is in him. What I am, he is. My name is his name, meaning my nature is his nature, which is why he can do what God does, forgive sins. So listen to him, don't anger him, or he won't forgive your sins because he embodies my name. Right there, that tells you it's Jesus. How do I know? Like the angel, Jesus has the power to forgive sins. Like the angel, God commands people to obey him. And like the angel, Jesus bears the name of the Father. Let's show you that in the New Testament. So, number one, like the angel, Jesus forgives sins. Mark 2, 5 to 10. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the uh, paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Mm. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Exactly what the Quran says in chapter 3. Verse 135, who can forgive sins except Allah? And yet God said, the angel won't forgive your sins. If you anger him, my name is in him. But only God can forgive sins. And Jesus, like the angel, does what only God can do, forgive sins. Because he goes on to say, I am able to forgive sins because he's no mere man. Keep reading. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, how do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk. Wow. So wait. But Jesus says, I'm now going to prove to you that I have the power to forgive sins. I'm going to heal this paralyzed man, a physical miracle which you can see, to confirm to you I can do what you cannot see, forgive sins. Because what does he say in verse 10? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Wow. Wait, Albie, you're telling me that Jesus, like the angel, has the power to do what only God does, forgive sins? Exactly. And then Jesus, like the angel, bears the name of God because he's one with God. And God tells people, listen to Jesus like he told them to listen to the angel. Go to Matthew 17, verse 5. Now, here's what's beautiful, guys. In Exodus 23, God is appearing in a pillar of cloud on the mountain. If you read Exodus 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, and the pillar of cloud descends on the mountain. Moses goes up to the mountain. In the cloud is God and the angel. Now watch, Jesus is on a high mountain, Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. He's transfigured. Moses and Elijah appear. Guys, watch the connection. Moses in Exodus, chapters 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, is on a mountain. The pillar of cloud comes down on the mountain. Moses enters the mountain, and in the mountain is God and the angel of God. And Moses sees God and the angel visibly and receives commands. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. Jesus goes on a mountain with Peter, James, and John. Moses and Elijah appear, and then a cloud comes down. And what does the cloud say in Matthew 17, 5? While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Wait, like the angel, God says to Moses and the people, 
Obey his voice, don't provoke him. And God says the same thing about Jesus on a mountain. You better hear him because he's my son whom I love. So Jesus, like the angel, has power to forgive sins. Jesus, like the angel, must be obeyed or you'll be punished. And Jesus, like the angel, bears the name of God. How do I know? Because in Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. So the Father's name is the Son's name, the Spirit's name. Now let me give you more proof that the angel is Jesus. Remember, the angel forgives sins, right? Yes. And Jesus in Romans 8, 34, intercedes for us at the right hand of God the Father. Romans 8, 34, it says Christ has been raised, and he's at the right hand of God who intercedes for us, who defends us, and defends us against who? Satan. Because in Revelation 12, 10, we're told, Satan in heaven accuses us. So Jesus at the right hand of God, Romans 8, 34, intercedes for us, and Satan until he's thrown out of heaven, goes to heaven to accuse us. And who defends us? Jesus. Revelation 12, 10, the accuser of our brethren who accuses them day and night has been thrown out of heaven. So Jesus intercedes for us and defends us against Satan's accusations. Go to Zechariah chapter 3. I want you to read verses 1 and 2. Look what the angel does. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Yahweh, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Wow, wait. The angel is there and Satan is there to accuse an elect of God, Joshua? And what is Satan doing there? To accuse him. Hmm. That's what the New Testament says Satan does. But who's going to defend Joshua? The angel of the Lord. Because look what he says in verse 2. And Yahweh said to Satan, Yahweh rebuke you, Satan. Yahweh who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Wow. So did you see what the angel said? Here the angel said to be Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh is Yahweh, and he rebukes Satan, name of Yahweh, saying, who are you to accuse Joshua when God saved him from destruction? So here, like Jesus, the angel defends God's people against Satan's slander. So the angel is doing what Jesus does because he is Jesus. So Jesus has been defending God's people in heaven from the beginning, even before he became flesh and died for us. But now watch why Joshua could be saved from Satan's accusation. Now, guys, please pay attention to how powerful this angel is. Because in Zechariah 3, notice verses 3 and 4. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And by the way, if you look at the word filthy, you know what it is literally? Same thing as Isaiah 64, 6. No, shit. He was clothed with shitty garments. It's literally the Hebrew. I'm not lying. It's his garments were stained with shit, shitty clothing. I'm not lying. That's the literal translation. But you're not going to get it in English. So that's our. So that's what our sin looks like, huh? Yeah, it says like shit. His clothes were stained with shit, shitty. So now his clothes that are shitty represent his sinfulness that it's shitty. But now who forgives him and purifies him? Watch. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying take away the filthy garments from him and to him he said see i have removed your iniquity from you and i will clothe you with rich robes so the angel says i removed your sins your filth and i clothe you with festal garments so the angel has forgiven him his sins, clothed him in pure garments, defended him against Satan, and yet Jesus forgives us our sins, clothes us in pure garments, garments that are white. He has the power to forgive sins and defends us against Satan. Could it be any clearer that this angel is Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. But now let me give you the proof that the angel is Jesus because do you guys know that the angel is God's son? He's called the Son of God. But you got to be careful of the translation you read. This is why you're going to read either New King James or King James. Daniel 3, 25, when Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fire after he threw Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, he saw a fourth man, one who looked like a man. So he saw four men. And he says, the appearance of the fourth man is like that of the Son of God. 
And then we're told that fourth man who's the son of God is the angel of God who was sent to save the people of God. So in Daniel 3, 25 and 28. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. So that they should not the fourth man was the angel of God. Who is the son of God. Yes. And the little translation is bar alahin. Though it's plural, it's not gods. Be careful what translations say. And the fourth one looked like the son of the gods. Because Nebuchadnezzar knows it's not the gods that sent the angel because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fire because they wouldn't worship his gods, but worship their God alone. So the last thing Nebuchadnezzar would say, oh, he's the son of the gods. No, he's not because they defied your gods. It's their God who's saving them. So in Hebrew and Aramaic, plural nouns can function as a singular noun, like Elohim. We don't say gods. We say God when referring to the true God. So that's why King James, New King James got it right. Son of God, who is the angel of God, who appears as a man who saves us from our trials. So here you have the angel of God, who's the son of God, who is sent to save the people of God. That's exactly who Jesus is. The son of God, who's sent by God as his messenger, because that's what an angel is, to save God's people and punish the wicked. There is no doubt this angel is Jesus Christ, which is why the early church fathers said that's Jesus Christ. And further proof that Daniel 3.25 should be rendered as son of God, the Greek version of Daniel and the Latin version of Daniel read singular, son of God, singular in the Greek and in Latin, showing you they understood Allahin to be a singular noun. Now, one more reference that the angel is God. Let me show you who people think the angel is when they see him. Let's look at two references, okay. Let's go to Gen Judges 13, 17 to 22. And this too proves the angel is Jesus. Judges 13, 17 to 22. Watch here. Then Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, what is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of Yahweh said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. Let me break that down. When they're asking him that they don't know it's the angel, they think it's just a man. So Manoah says, what's your name? So we honor you. He goes, don't ask about my name. It is wonderful. The word for wonderful means beyond comprehension. Don't try to figure me out. I'm beyond your ability to comprehend. Name in the Bible can refer to your nature. So he's basically saying, my nature is beyond your comprehension. It's too wonderful for you to comprehend. Number one, no mere angelic creature can say he's beyond comprehension. Only God is beyond comprehension. Secondly, the word wonderful, remember what it is in Hebrew. Pali. It is Pali, beyond comprehension. They still don't know that this is the angel of God. They think it's a man. Now watch what happens. Now continue reading. Then Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock of Yahweh. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up towards heaven from the altar, the angel of Yahweh ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. Pause right there. Let me explain this. They, the man standing before them did something amazing. As the flame went up, he jumped into the flame and disappeared. So imagine I'm a man. I'm standing. I'm looking at you. <sharp inhale> Jump in the flame, disappear. He became part of the sacrifice. And he disappeared. Then they knew that wasn't an ordinary man. So who was this man? Mono realized he was who? Keep reading. When the angel of Yahweh appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of Yahweh. I'll emphasize that. It says Manoah knew he was the angel of Yahweh. He knew this was the messenger of Yahweh. It says he knew he was the angel. But then why does he say that he saw God because he says he knew it was the angel of Yahweh, but now notice verse 22. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall truly die, 
Because we have seen God. I'm confused, brother. It says he knew it was the angel who appeared as a man. But he knew this angel who appeared as a man was God. So they were looking at God. So you're telling me he knew this angel wasn't a creature, but it was God appearing as a man? Looks like the doctrine was established before the nice year. He's not the only one who, when he saw the angel, thought he was looking at God. So let's go to our final example. Genesis 16, 7 to 14. Now the angel of Yahweh found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. This is Hagar. Angel of Yahweh, notice. Angel of Yahweh found Hagar. By the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. <clears throat> the angel of Yahweh said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of Yahweh said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. Pause right there. The angel is speaking, says, I will give you descendants, physical offspring that cannot be counted. They'll be like the stars. Who does the angel think he is? Because he's now claiming to be creator and life giver. I will create descendants for you. I will give you physical offspring as numerous as the stars in heaven. He's claiming to be the one who creates and gives life. Who does he think he is? God. Can you reread verse 10 again so that they don't miss it? Those who are paying attention and not just wasting time here. And the angel of Yahweh said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of Yahweh said to her, Behold, you are with child. And you shall bear a son. Wait, so he knew the gender of the child in her womb? You have a son in your belly. Keep going. You shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has heard your affliction. Mm. He shall be a wild ass man. Wait, his the angel knew. Wait, hold on. The angel knew what kind of personality he'll have and how he would be before he was born. He's going to be a wild ass of a man, meaning he'll be undomesticated. Donkeys don't settle, they travel. So he's going to be a Bedouin, an Arab nomad. Well, he wasn't Arab, but you get the point. He won't settle. He won't be able to be domesticated. He can't be controlled. How did the angel know his character before he was born? Because he created him. And he knew his future before it happened. Now keep reading. He shall be a wild ass man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hands against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Then she called the name of Yahweh, who spoke to her. Wait, who spoke to her? Yahweh. But in verses 7 all the way to 12, it was the angel who spoke to her. So the angel speaking to her, is Yahweh speaking to her? So Moses narrated. Okay, but now notice what Hagar calls him, this angel she saw. What did she say? Read 13. Then she called the name of Yahweh, who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? I'm confused. Like Manoah, Hagar realized this angel of God. But like Manoah, she realized this angel is the God who sees everything. And that I've actually looked on the God who sees me. And she's shocked because they thought if you see God, you die. Just like Manoah saying, we've seen God. So both Manoah... And Hagar knew the angel who's appearing as a man in visible form is not a creature, but he's God. And they're looking at God and beholding God. Sam, can I ask you, yeah, can I ask you a question? Is yes. The word Ahar is used in the in Say the, again? Hebrew, the word Ahar in the Hebrew is yeah. being used, but it's not translated, but it means like the rear of the back. Yeah. Would it be safe to be able to insert that in there to see? I've seen the back of him. Who not really. Ahar doesn't always mean back. It's not always, it doesn't, it, that's not how the word is used at times. It simply means that, trying to figure out a verse that I can show you. It doesn't always mean back, right? So, it, it, no, I wouldn't take it that far. But yeah, I know what you're trying to say. That's saying she's not seeing him in his, the fullness of his glory, but in a manifestation, just like God says, you'll see my back. Yeah, it can mean that, but that's not always the meaning of that term. I, yeah. I see. Yeah, but the, uh, the whole point is, she realizes this angel is appearing visibly is God, not a creature, which is why the angel does what God does, create and give life. 
And even Manoah realized that angel, that's God. God showed up as a man. So they're all realizing this angel sent by God is God. And God says he's God, which is why he can forgive sins or punish you. And lo and behold, here's my challenge to you, anti-Trinitarians. Are you aware in the New Testament, this angel of God who speaks as God, who claims to be God, who's worshipped as God, who does things that only God can do? You don't find that angel appearing in the New Testament as an angel anymore? In other words, in New Testament, when angels show up, they don't speak this way. They'll say, I'm a servant, I'm a slave like you, or I'm Gabriel. But they don't say, I'm God, or I will create and give life. Why? What happened to that angel, guys? How come that angel doesn't appear in the New Testament? Or does he? Let's see who's listening. Where's that angel? How come we don't see this angel who says he's God and does what God does in the New Testament? We see angels, but they say, I'm slaves, I'm servants, or I'm Gabriel. Where is this angel? Why did he disappear in the New Testament? What's the answer for those who are listening? You see it. One of them said, no, he didn't disappear. He became a man. The angel still appears in the New Testament, but now he has a human identity because he became flesh from the virgin. That angel is now Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You got it, folks. Amen. God bless you. But now the final connection that the angel is Jesus. You remember in Judges 13, 18, he says, why do you ask me my name? Seeing it is wonderful, Pali. Wonderful, guys. Okay, now let's go to Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Wait, wait. God a child born, a male baby born, his name is Wonderful Pele. The angel says, my name is wonderful Pali from the same root. Are you seeing who the child is? The angel says, my name is wonderful. The child born in Isaiah 9, his name is wonderful, but what else is his name? His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Wow, wait. So like the angel, he's God and he's mighty and wonderful because the child born is the angel. That's why Orthodox, you guys who read the Greek, when the Jews translated Isaiah 9 into Greek, they identified the angel, the child as the angel of great counsel. Did you guys know that? The Greek translation of Isaiah 9 says the child is the angel of great counsel, showing that the Jews knew this child is the angel of the Lord becoming flesh. Let me read it. Yeah, go ahead. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called the Angel of Great Counsel. So I shall bring peace upon the rulers, peace and health by him.